I used to say the first step is tying on my shoes. That's the hardest, but it really is walking out the door for me and taking that first step. Every single run that I have to do, once I have that first step and I get moving, it's like, yes, I'm there. Because I don't always feel like running. Once I run, I'm happy, but I always feel like it. So find opportunities when your kids are in activities, but that you normally would sit, start moving. Hello, and welcome to the May 17th, 2024 edition of the TriDoc Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sankoff, the TriDoc, an emergency physician, triathlon coach, and multiple Ironman finisher coming to you, as always, from beautiful, sunny Denver, Colorado. We recently learned, at least to my great shock and consternation, that the T100 series had not been doing any drug testing of its athletes that were participating at the professional level in any of its series races. Now, you will recall that just last year, Colin Chartier, who won the U.S. Open on the PTO circuit, tested positive for drugs as part of the Ironman drug testing program. And when this drug test was revealed, many were shocked. Professionals themselves were the most outspoken at how this felt like a betrayal and how this was probably not the only isolated incident. And everybody spoke out with a large amount of anger and dismay at the situation. Well, how is it then that over a year later, we are finding out that the T100 didn't do any drug testing on its own? And how is it that professionals who ostensibly are mainly the driving force behind this series either didn't know or didn't care that this wasn't happening? I find this to be just mind-boggling and honestly, just yet another kind of dint in the glow that the T100 tries to put on itself as the representative organization of the professionals in our sport. I don't know. To me, this is really not okay. And I'm glad that they finally saw the light after a certain amount of pressure was put on it by social media, uh, the likes of the Instagram account, Professional Triathlon. And they have now decided to join with the World Triathlon group in order to do drug testing of their athletes who aren't already being tested by Ironman or their regional testing programs. Now, that's a start. But I still don't think it's enough. If we really want to be sure that we are facing clean sport, I continue to feel like drug testing needs to be extended into the age group ranks. We are seeing results, especially in some of the older age groups, that just defy explanation. I mean, yeah, you can train hard. You can look amazing as you get older. But the idea that some of these people are racing completely clean just doesn't really sit well with me. I'm not saying that it has to be widespread. I'm not saying that it has to be at every race, but maybe start with the world championships. It doesn't even have to be the podium finishers. It can be a random selection of athletes who show up there. Just test for some of the things that are likely to be used. Testosterone supplementation is the best example I can think of, but there are a host of others that wouldn't make the testing that prohibitively expensive. And as we have seen over and over again, athletes themselves want this and are willing to pay a small supplement in order to cover the cost. So the T100 is finally getting its act together and doing random testing of its athletes who aren't already in other programs. I'd like to see them extend that to double test, so test athletes who are in other programs because more testing isn't worse, it's probably better. And let's see both the T100 and Ironman finally consider extending testing into the age group athletes and the age group ranks. What do you think? I'd be interested in your feedback and thoughts on this. Send me an email at tri underscore doc at icloud.com or put your comments into the private Facebook group. What? You're not a member. How can this be? Search for TriDoc Podcast on Facebook. Answers the three very easy questions. I'll grant you admittance. You can join the conversation about this subject and others and potentially give me a question that you want us to answer on the medical mailbag. 
Other news in triathlon includes the recent WTCS World Triathlon Series competition in Yokohama, Japan, where Olympic slots were on the line, and the qualifying race continues to be fierce. Taylor Nib, though, just continues to be amazing. That woman can compete and win and or at least be on the podium at just about any distance. It's really quite astonishing. She proved her bona fides yet again, finishing uh, second place in the women's race. Other American women held themselves incredibly well, three of them finishing in the top five, including Kristen Casper, who came in at fifth place. Taylor Spivey was in fourth, just ahead of her by a couple of seconds. Neither of those women were able to secure an automatic bid into the Olympics, and so they will try again at the final event coming up in Spain in just a couple of weeks. We will see then what the final roster looks like. One of the women who's unlikely to be on that roster is defending gold medalist from just a couple of Olympics ago, and that's Gwen Jorgensen. Gwen faced a stiff competition in the race in Yokohama and is not on the start list for the final race of the qualifying period that's coming up in Spain. So it would appear that the American women's team, barring some kind of surprise announcement will not include Jorgensen this time around. On the show today, the medical mailbag features an update on the literature on compression garments, specifically pneumatic compression garments, similar to the Normatec, the most popular brand that's out there. I first reviewed this subject back in episode three, that's like five years ago, and I had received a couple of questions from listeners about whether or not anything had changed, whether there was new information or new evidence that might shed new light on whether or not these devices actually provide benefit to athletes in terms of improved recovery and improved racing ability, or at least training ability after a hard workout. Well, Coach Juliet Hawkman and I take a look at the evidence that has come out in the intervening years and we'll give you our insights and our recommendations. That's coming up in just a short bit. A little bit later on, I'm going to be joined by my guest for this episode, Doreen Morin Van Dam, who is a woman of Dutch heritage. She's an incredibly busy and successful entrepreneur. She has her own podcast on social media affairs and promotion, but she's also quite an avid runner. And she got back to running after dabbling, shall we say, a little bit in triathlon and running in her 20s. She got back to running after having her fourth child and looking to be a little more active. And she's been running and smiling while doing it ever since. She shares her journey as a very busy woman, a very busy mom, doing her best to succeed at running and life in general. And she shares how she got back to doing that and how she succeeds. And that's all coming up a little bit later on. Before all of that, I want to take a moment to thank, as always, all of my Patreon supporters of this podcast, who have decided that for about the price of a cup of coffee per month, they could sign up to support this program, and in doing so, get access to bonus interviews and other segments that come out about a monthly basis or so. Those bonus episodes are available on a private feed for all of my subscribers. Plus, for North American subscribers who sign up at the $10 per month level of support, they receive a special thank you gift in the form of a BOCO TriDoc podcast running hat. So I hope that you'll visit my Patreon site today at patreon.com forward slash TriDoc podcast and consider becoming a supporter so that you can get access and maybe this cool gift as well. And as always, I thank you in advance just for considering. It's time again for the Medical Mailbag, that segment of the program when I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Juliet Hockman, a fellow coach at LifeSport, who I just had the great pleasure of spending a solid week with out in North Carolina, where we were both coaching a triathlon camp. Juliet, it's good to see you again so soon. Wasn't that a fantastic week we just had? Yeah, it's only been 48 hours. It seems like a long time ago already. But yeah, great week. And I have two words for you and our listeners. Devil's whip. Yeah, right. <laughs> so Devil's Whip so, is a stretch. It's a stretch of road that we climbed and descended any number of times as we uh, got faster and more comfortable, particularly on the descent. Fantastic bike handling skills, climbing skills, all of the things. So we it was a bike-centered camp. We had a terrific time, 11 life-sworn athletes, and just a really good week of, of training and camaraderie and, and spending time together. I, I say, uh, I, you know, I've, I've said uh, many times how I think triathlon camps are just a, a wonderful experience for athletes. 
I continue now. This is what our third time doing this. This is my yeah. my third year that I will say that it's my favorite thing to do as a coach. I mean, it just it's the highlight of my year to spend so much time with athletes, even those athletes who continue to insist on wearing clothes branded by a certain podcast that shall not be named here. <laughs> Nita, Nita, I'm talking to you, and uh, and and just. It's like a, a shot, a knife to the to the back every time I saw her. But all the same, all the same, I just loved being with those athletes all the time, being able to see them grow over the course of the week. It, it was just great. I just love doing it, and I can't. I'm already thinking about next year. I know you are as well. Yeah, I understand. We had our debrief meeting today, and sort of thinking about what we did well, what we could do better. Just all the growth, as you said, and seeing athletes descend something they were scared of, climb something they didn't think they could do. And just also just get to know each, get to know all the athletes a little bit better because being in person is so much better than training peaks and Zoom calls. Uh, unsurprisingly, I think for me, one of my favorite things that we did was the coaches Q&A night. I really enjoyed getting these questions that we had no foreknowledge of from the athletes. They were really varied and diverse and, well, I guess varied and diverse, that's redundant, but they were uh, really, they were really interesting questions and we all got a chance to give our own answers. And while we all had sort of tweaks on a similar theme in our answers, they were different enough that I think it was really interesting for me to listen to the different answers. And I just thought it was, it was great. And that's yeah, what we do here on this segment. Nice so, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that's I what we do here. At... For the, I think it's valuable for the athletes to hear perspectives from three different coaches, even if they, as you said, were somewhat similar, everybody had a different, a slightly different twist. And I think it's good for athletes to acknowledge there's a lot of ways to skin a fish. Yeah. Skin a fish. That's interesting. Skin, skin a, cat, a cat, no? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's move on from the de-epilating of animals onto the question that we have today, since we're talking about questions. And that question comes from the Facebook group for the TriDoc Podcast, that private Facebook group, or our listeners are encouraged to become a member and join the conversation where you can ask questions and comment on different things that you hear. So, Juliet, what is the question for today? Right. So, athletes are curious if there has been any new research or findings that have come out regarding compression boots, essentially. There's lots of different brands out there. There's a couple of main brands that we all know, Normatech, Speedhound, but there's a whole bunch of knockoffs as well. And you talked about this in your third episode, number three. And what are we, 150 something now? Yeah, yeah, we're just around 150. And we, I first talked about this in, I think it was January of 2019 in episode wow. three. So it's going back a long ways. And I think it's reasonable to revisit a subject, especially if there is new evidence. And I was pretty surprised to find that, indeed, there has been a ton of research that has come out since that first time we talked about it. So why not take a look and see if anything new has come out? At the time, when I reviewed the research back in 2019, I said that, no, these recovery boots don't really seem to offer any major benefits in terms of recovery or performance, but they definitely gave a psychological benefit. And what I meant by that at the time and what I continue to mean by that now is just that they feel good. And if you, I said at the time, if you've got the disposable income, if the purchase of a set of Normatex or whatever brand you're going for is something that you think is something you can afford, and as long as you're not going in with very high expectations, why not take the plunge? I have a pair. I very much enjoy sitting around in them. And uh, I know that our athletes at camp had available to them a couple of pairs of Speedhound, which are the comparable compression, inflatable compression boots that are made by a different company, and they loved using them. So what does the research say now, several years later, has anything come out? And we found several papers, one of them that just came out in this year, 2024, and it was called The Effects of Intermittent Pneumatic Compression on the Recovery of Cardiovascular Parameters after repeated sprint exercise. So this requires probably just a little bit of background. Just to remind you, these pneumatic compression garments are boots that you sort of zip up over your legs. They usually go up to the level of the hip. Some of the brands like the Normatex actually come with an accessory, almost like these shorts that you can pull up over your, your up to your pelvis, basically. So you can actually include the glutes and the muscles of the pelvis as well. 
and you can connect those and get inflation of those. And essentially what these devices do is they squeeze sequentially from the lowest part of the boot to the highest part of the boot with high amounts of air pressure. So you're basically getting this, you're sitting on the, the couch and you've got your boots on and you've attached it to this machine and the machine just pumps air into these different cells, these compartments. The first one is over your foot, the second one's over your calf, the third one's over your knee, and the fourth one is over your upper thigh. And it goes in sequence and the idea is that you're increasing the amount of pressure from lower to higher, and it's kind of squeezing out the juice from your legs and then releases all together all at once to allow blood flow to come back into the legs. There are a couple of theories about how these things work. Number one, when you exercise, as we've said numerous times on this, this show before, when you do exercise, you cause some small damage within the muscles. That isn't a normal part of exercise. It's how we get stronger. And when that happens, you end up with a certain amount of fluid that rushes into the cells, an inflammatory process that really helps with the building up of the muscles to be better off the next time you do a strong exercise. And that fluid can cause some swelling in the area. And by using these compression boots, the idea is, is that you're going to squeeze out that, inf that inflammatory fluid back into the bloodstream. And that's what this first study is looking at, this idea of the recovery of cardiovascular parameters, because if there's a shift of fluid into the cells, then that fluid is not within your cardiovascular space. So does using these compression garments actually return fluid back into the vascular space and allow your cardiovascular numbers to look better? That's one of the theories about how this works. Another theory is that just squeezing the legs like this, squeezing the cells is actually just sort of like flushing out all of the evil humors. So built up of lactic acid and built up of all the, the little byproducts of cell destruction and inflammation that have come along. That's the second idea. And then the third idea is just like massage. When we, when massage therapists work on a sore muscle, what they're doing is they're rubbing and they're, they're working on that muscle and exposing pressure. And the response to that is that the blood vessels in the area dilate, blood kind of rushes in there and it brings in nourishment and takes away all of these bad things. Okay, so those are the three kind of theories. The first of these papers looks at this idea, well, does using intermittent pneumatic compression actually help with these cardiovascular parameters? 16 athletes, seven females, nine males, randomly divided into two groups of intermi intermittent pneumatic compression or a sham. I don't know what the sham was. It's kind of hard to do this with uh, without letting the athletes know what's going on. They looked at cardiovascular variables like blood pressure, heart function, and peripheral vascular resistance. I'll skip to the chase. The uh, there was blood pressure got a little bit higher in the IPC group. Uh, the the people who were had the boots on. The reason for that is clearly because you're squeezing the blood vessels in the legs, so there's a higher blood pressure. Cardiac output tended to get a little bit higher in the IPC group as well, simply because that what I said, you're squeezing the legs, you're allowing for fluid to get back into the blood ve blood vessels and increase the cardiac output. However, all in all, these changes in cardiac, cardi uh, cardiac output and chain was offset by the blood pressure. And so the end result is that it was kind of hard to say whether or not these cardiovascular changes were really meaningful in any way and kind of hard to know if it meant anything for recovery or for performance. Second study does external pneumatic compression treatment between bouts of overreaching resistance training. So this is weight training. Exert differential effects on molecular signaling and performance related variables compared to passive recovery. This was an exploratory study that basically looked at 20 athletes, all males, in this case doing resistance exercise and looking at blood levels of inflammatory markers and then putting them through the uh, pneumatic compression garments. They asked them questions about muscle soreness. They then had them actually do repeat strength exercises to see if there was any true difference after using these devices. And again, there were some reports of subjective improvements in muscle soreness, but when it came to actually performance, when it came to actually doing the strength exercise, there was no difference between using the pneumatic devices or not. A third study, randomized control trial, manual therapy, and pneumatic compression for recovery from prolonged running. This is a particularly interesting one because this looked at an ultra marathon in New Zealand. They had these athletes running pretty significant distances. And after the distances, they were divided into three groups. 
They either got intermittent pneumatic compression, massage, or passive recovery. Gosh, who would want to be in the passive recovery group? I given know, the other what two a bummer. Options, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, I drew the short straw here. Yeah. <laughs> All the athletes provided blood samples to look at their creatine kinase. They had subjective measurements of lower body muscle pain and soreness. They also then did for seven consecutive days. And on day 14, they had to record their muscle soreness and fatigue. And then did complete uh, uh, self-timed 400 meter runs on day three, five, seven, and fourteen. So, really, a, a very nicely designed study to look at subjective measures of soreness and fatigue, as well as objective measures of their ability to run these 400 meter runs. Now, here they were doing an ultra, so obviously not running very fast, and now being asked to kind of sprint through 400. So a little bit of a apples and oranges comparison of what they did in the race versus what they did after. But still, I think it's a reasonable kind of thing. They had a very large sample size, 56 of them. Uh, 19 of those were in the massage, 19 were control, and 18 in the uh, pneumatic compression group. And what they found was when they asked them about subjective measures of muscle fatigue, they tended to be lower in the pneumatic compression group. So again, subjective, this, this idea that, hey, it made me feel better. I wasn't as fatigued. But this tended to last only for four days. After that, everybody seemed to be the same. The subjective ratings did not, however, translate into any improvement in performance. There was no difference in any of the three groups when it came to these 400-meter trials. So, and there was also no difference in any of the three groups for the blood levels of creatine kinase. So just to sum it up again, three groups, massage, no treatment or intermittent pneumatic compression. The people who got intermittent pneumatic compression said they felt better, but that only lasted for four days. After that, everybody was the same. And no matter what treatment, treatment group you were in, you ran 400 meters exactly the same. You had the same level of creatine kinase. So... Another example of where, hey, they make you feel better, but that doesn't translate into anything. And, and I have numerous other papers here. I'm not going to go through them all. It's, it's not worth it. They basically all say exactly the same thing in varying different ways. Basically, all these studies show that to one level or another, using these garments makes athletes feel better psychologically but there are zero benefits in terms of improved recovery, zero benefits in terms of improved performance, which is what Norman Tech would have you believe. I am not going to ever tell anybody not to get these because I said I have a pair, right? And I know yeah, you've used nice. them, right? Yeah, yeah, I loved them. Yeah, yeah. It seems and, like and it's too bad that last study didn't have a fourth group, which was athletes who did not sit for 20 minutes every day to rest. Because as you and I were talking about before we recorded, the perhaps the benefit of these boots is it makes you sit down on the couch for 20 to 30 minutes a day and just be still. So it'd be interesting that last study, if they had the massage, the compression boots, the placebo, which are not placebo, but the I can't remember the word. Passive recovery. Passive Passive yeah, passive recovery. recovery. And then someone who raced around doing errands all day and didn't sit down at all. (laughs) It just see. Which is what most age groupers do instead of recovery. And so that would be interesting to see if that fourth group did suffer effects. I mean, you could also use your handcuffs and handcuff somebody to the couch and probably have a similar recovery effect as a Norma check boots, but it wouldn't be as much fun. Yeah. I, I don't disagree with you. I, I, I like. I think we've both on the same page with this one. I think this is an example of something that. It's funny. I, there's this medical. There's this guy who does uh, reviews of medical papers, and he always says nobody has ever proved that you need to have a parachute, or, or that sorry, nobody's ever proved that a parachute works to to help you jump out of a plane. It's like, because it's a study that just doesn't have to be done. We just know intuitively that if you jump without a parachute, it's not going to end well. But if you jump with a parachute, you're going to do okay. And right. I feel like people could continue to do these studies with Normatex. They don't really need to. I don't feel like they, because the Normatex to me, what, what I don't like about the Normatex is that they continue to advertise that it improves your recovery and it improves your performance afterwards. And That I don't like because that's simply untrue. I have never found a paper that shows that that is anywhere close to reality. The reality is they could advertise 
in a very truthful manner and just say, Norma Techs make you feel awesome. They make you sit still after a big event. And that is going to decrease your muscle soreness just because it's forced rest and not just forced rest, but forced rest that actually makes you feel good. And to me, that's worth having a pair. Again, they're not cheap. And I would never tell everybody run out and buy these things because they're not inexpensive and you don't have to have them. I mean, like, like you said, if you just sit on the couch for 20 minutes, you'll probably get a lot of the same benefits. But I, I, if somebody wants to buy them and somebody asked me about them, I would say in a heartbeat, yeah, absolutely. You'll like them. I mean, I like them. I, why not? Yeah. So, and do no, do no harm. And also they feel good. Yeah. I'm so, yeah, we do, if you, if we you do get enough them, things. Them. We do enough things in our training that don't feel good don't and we still good. do them anyways. Right. right. <laughs> so, so this yeah. is one, this is one that feels good. So why not do it? Hey, why not? And, yeah, I kind of add it to the list of there's there's several things now, right? And I actually own a couple of these things. Massage guns is another one, also made by well, Hyperice, which is the company that distributes Normatex. They make a massage gun and and unfortunately they also <laughs> they have some disingenuous advertising there saying how it improves your stretching, it improves uh, sorry, it improves your warm up, it improves your recovery. It does all these things. It, the, the science doesn't support any of that. But you know what it does? It makes you feel good. If you got an ache, if you got yeah. this ache and this knot and you really need that massage gun is perfect for getting in there and really helping make that feel a little bit better. So they mm -hmm. could just advertise that. And I think that would do just fine for their sales. And it, I add it to that list of things. It, it, these are things that aren't going to harm, that, that aren't going to set you back. I mean, they are, listen, Norma Tex are pricey. I think, what are they still running about 400 bucks or so, I think. So it's not insignificant, but. If you've got that 400 bucks burning a hole in your pocket and you want to, you want to, and listen, most of the races they're out there, you could try them and see what they feel like. So it's not like you have to buy them unseen and you certainly don't have to buy them just because I say they make you feel good. So yeah, you, you, hon, you have a pair, don't you, Julia? No, I don't. I mean, I, I first tried them when we coached uh, camp together a couple of years ago in Utah and I loved them, but I think I've only used them once or twice where I've been able to do it in an Ironman Expo or with you or whatever. I didn't even get a chance to use them at this last camp in North Carolina because the athletes always have them on. So, but I wanted to. Yeah, they do feel good. They feel great. And they make you sit there and read a book or chat with a friend or play a card game or play on your Instagram or whatever for 20 minutes, which is not something I typically sit down and do. So it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it keeps you from listening to that other podcast. So yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> nobody nobody else is going to know what we're talking about and I we're not going to mention it <laughs> not to the podcast that shall not be named <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> well oh. i'm glad we i'm glad we had a chance to revisit this subject because it, it they remain popular it, and there was a lot of stuff that was published in the intervening what 2009 so geez five years wow five so it's years, been a long yeah. time i've been doing this yeah, yeah. Well, there's been a lot of stuff that's published. I think it was worthwhile revisiting it. And I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to admit that things have changed and that there's a new answer, but in this case, not so much. Well, if you have a question that you'd like for us to try and answer, and even if it's about something that we've reviewed previously, I hope that you will send it along. You can email me at tri underscore doc at iCloud.com, or you can join the same podcast uh, sorry, the same private Facebook group that I've been talking about for the podcast, which is easily found on Facebook, answers the three simple questions. I will grant you admittance. You could join the conversation there, ask your questions, and we will consider it for inclusion on the Medical Mailbag segment. Juliet, thank you once again for joining me. I look forward to the next conversation. I'm sure we will have another good question to answer soon. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Jeff. My guest on the program today is Doreen Morin Van Dam. She is a LinkedIn top voice in social media, a social media specialist, an organic social media specialist, international speaker, and certified agile marketer at More in Media. She hosts Strategy Talks, a live stream show and podcast, and you'll always recognize her on stage and online, and you would if you could see her right now by the fact that she's always got something orange, mostly her glasses. Today, she's wearing an orange tinge sweatshirt as well, all of it being a nod to her Dutch heritage. Doreen started running back in her 20s. She did a couple of triathlons, all of that before she had children. And then after having her fourth child, got back into running. 
and has been running ever since. She's done numerous marathons, half marathons, and has made running a big part of her life. And that's why she's here today on the TriDark Podcast to talk about how she balances being a busy mom, busy business person, and getting running and eating well to be a big part of her ongoing lifestyle. Doreen, thanks so much for joining me here on the TriDark Podcast. I'm so excited to be here. I absolutely love running. And this is so funny. My my young adult children will look at me every time I'm in a picture running. They go, why are you always smiling? Because they associate running with pain. I associate it with endorphins and fun. It's my outlet. I absolutely love it. Every single, almost every single picture that's ever been taken of me running, I smile. Well, tell me a little bit about that, because I know that for a lot of women, when they have kids, running or any kind of endurance sport becomes really difficult to do. I know when I had younger kids, it was really hard to get training done. And I'm the dad. I, um, I know for moms, it's significantly harder. But at what point did you realize that that was something that was really missing and you wanted to get back to it? I think I looked at some pictures of myself. I didn't look I didn't like who I was, what I looked like, but also I didn't really like what I what I felt. So I had a friend. This was my my youngest one was about a year old. I have four kids. The other three were a little bit older. There's a four and a half year gap. And so I had a friend who was running and she invited me probably once a week. And I would say, no, I'm not ready. No, I'm not ready. So I actually started in secret. I started the day after Thanksgiving. I would run at night. I did it for six weeks in the dark by myself because I didn't want anybody to see me. And then the next time she asked me, I said, sure, because I knew I could run three miles. So that's how I got started. We were the early morning warriors. She had three kids. I had four kids. Um, we lived in South Carolina. We could year run year round. But what we figured out is we both had to be home at 6.30 a.m. because that's when the kids would be ready to be, wake up and go to school. So whether we had a five-mile run, a seven-mile run, a 10-mile run, and later when we trained for our first marathon, a 15 or a 20 mile run, we would be home by 6.30. So we just count it back. What time do we have to meet? We would meet at 5 a.m. or 4.30 a.m. or 5.30 a.m. At, at the light in between our houses. And there were definitely nights that we, she would have a sick child or I would have a sick child. But having somebody waiting for you, knowing that somebody's waiting at the light at a certain time is what got me up. So the first tip I would give to anybody that wants to get started, this is a long story short, is get somebody to run with. Find somebody who has some of the same goals as you. And either whether that's at night or in the morning, find a time that you can um, run. And for me, it was at morning time. It didn't take away from my family time. And so I just knew if I walked in the door at 5, 625, I could start my coffee pot. I would wake up the kids. I would have my coffee while they get ready. And then when I had gotten them off to school, I could shower and get myself ready for the day. So that really was important to have that person with me, to know that she would be there, I would be there. And that's how we trained for our first half and then our first marathon together, she and I. You're touching on a couple of things that I've talked about several times on this program, and it's uh, accountability and community. Uh, two things that I think are so integral to people having success, especially in endurance sport that really is demanding on your time, demanding on your ability to commit. And I think when you try to do it alone, it can be really difficult. And you are really, I think, giving voice to exactly that kind of sentiment and, the, and what your strategy was to make sure that you and your friend were accountable to each other and you had that community uh, with each other. The other thing that I always talk about is having your team and your family is a big part of your team. Your team has to be involved. Your team has to support you. How much did your children understand that this was important to you? I mean, I'm sure you probably were tired at night and had to go to sleep early. How much did they kind of understand and let mom go to sleep early and not give them give mom a hard time? Oh, well, that's really it's funny that you bring that up because I'm Dutch. And in the Dutch, we like it's really important to get sleep. I think the Dutch babies on average, if you Google it, sleep the most hours uh, at any baby in the world. We go to bed on time. We eat. We're very regulated. It comes from Calvinism. So I would this was the time of my life when I started running that my kids, we would have dinner at 530, 6 o'clock baths, 630 books and 7 o'clock in bed every single night. That was until my oldest kid started middle school. 
they seven and he could read till eight, but they were in bed at seven. So if I need, if I was tired, I usually put myself in bed by nine o'clock. So for our lifestyle, that worked. Now it could also have been the other way around that if I wanted to sleep in, I could run at night. I have tried both and I've always been an early riser. I really am doing better in the morning. I've tried running at night. My legs just feel like mush. I feel like I can't do anything. I feel like I can't eat during the day if I do that. And that brings me to like something that we might be talking about is I have tried both running with food, running on an empty stomach, even for races. And I have figured out that if I eat well the week prior to any race or any big long run, that I just run on empty stomach and I fuel once I start running, but I don't eat anything before I go out. So I figured out that in the morning, if I just put out my shoes at night and my clothes, laid out my clothes, check the weather, laid out my clothes, text my friend a time, 4.30, I would go. I would get up and go. And there was nothing else I needed to do. I would just literally put my hair in a, in a ponytail, put on my shoes and, and just get out the door and making it easy for yourself. That That's really it. But for my family, as far as that, it was pretty easy. Now, if I wanted to run on the weekends, telling you in the green room earlier, I, we lived on a golf course at that time. So my older children were like five, seven, nine. They could ride bikes. So I would say, let's go for a bike ride. And then my youngest, I push in a jogging stroller. We would have to do it before or after, of course, the golfers were out there because you can't be on the bike path, on the golf path, on the cart path with bikes if people were golfing. But early in the morning or after dinner, we would go for bike rides and they would just ride their bikes. They would know to stop at the, at the if there was a road, they would stop at the road, wait for me to catch up and then go. And they absolutely loved it. They loved having the freedom, quote unquote, to bike on their own with those parameters in place, knowing that I would be close behind, but not like right with them. And um, that worked for several years. Well, and you're you're giving voice to another aspect that, that I talk about as being integral to success for training for these kinds of things, which is making sure the training fits your life as opposed to trying to adapt your life to training. And you're you're just giving voice to so many of these things so nicely. I do think that we could all learn from the Dutch <laughs> a lot here. Yeah. It's probably true in a lot of things, but definitely in terms of early to bed, early to rise. I, I am interested in in learning a little bit more about your fueling because I have athletes who do similar, have to get up early, do their exercise before work, and they're always asking me. And I, I am a big advocate on not in, exercising fasted. I think it's really important that you be fueled to work out. And mm -hmm. so I always counsel people, make sure that you at least get something in your stomach. I'm, I'm interested in what you were saying, though. You, you start fasted, but you start fueling right away, which is a, a perfectly reasonable way to do things. So how were you? Obviously, everybody has to figure out what works for them. You figured out that this worked for you. So give me an example of how you would approach that. Yeah, sure. So imagine being up early in the morning and training for a long, long run. Um, I trained a lot on the golf cart, uh, golf, golf, what do you call it? The, the golf um, cart path. Yeah, the golf cart path for years, right? Before the golfers came out. So I would sometimes would get in eight miles before the first foursome would take off. So there were a lot of loops. So one of the things that I have figured out, and, and if I couldn't be on the path, I would do a loop in my neighborhood. But I would put, and I have to end up having to put it in my mailbox because animals would come and grab it. But I would put some gels, a banana, some fuel in my mailbox, a couple extra water bottles. So I could just run by my mailbox, grab something. Now for the longer runs going, I figured out that psychologically it was really hard for me to keep doing circles. I just figured if I run out 10 miles and I have to make it back 10, <laughs> it's a little bit, it's a, it's a crazy thing, but I just, so then I had to start carrying it with me, right? My brother, I grew up in the Netherlands with three older brothers who all were heavy into bicycle racing. And this is, think, 80s, where not a lot of- Saxo Bank and Rabobank. And yes, exactly. My oldest brother ended up being national champion road biking, right? So I grew up with the boys doing all this stuff and I watched them, but I was never really invited to be part of that. And I probably didn't show enough interest, but I did watch the fueling. And so they would, they had these run, these biking jackets with these pockets in the back. And I would watch them walk out the door with three bananas and a, a badon with all kinds of drinks, even then energy drinks in it. And 
before they would go on an actual race, they would fuel with rice and fruit. I, I, it was very interesting. My, my brothers would get these cans of fruit that I don't know if they were syrup and water. They would put that over rice and they would just stuff themselves because then would, they would have to drive somewhere probably about three hours before race start. So that's what I watched. So when I started running, initially it was maybe an hour at a time. I really didn't need any fuel. It was winter time when I started. By the time May came around South Carolina, it was hot, it was humid. And I remember hitting a wall at mile six and my friend pulled out a gel and says, you want to try one? So I was like, sure. And sure enough, instead of seven, we did like nine that day because both of us felt better. So that was my first experience was like fueling during a run because I kind of hit that wall. And so I've started experimenting. I actually have a really old um, cycling jacket that one of my brothers gave me. And I actually run in it in, with winter, in the winter in Vermont. And I put stuff in my pockets. I love it. I can put my phone in it. But I also put that extra banana and the gels and everything in the running jacket. So I have fuel with me. Now, my first marathon that I ever ran, I fueled before the run. I had tr tried different things during the test. And I'm like, there's no way I can go run a full marathon and not eat. So I got up at 2.30, ate a breakfast at 3, start was at 6. And I really didn't feel that great. I, I ran a very good marathon. It's still my fastest ever. Don't ever do that. Don't ever put all of that out there like that. I can never get that goal again. But that's a different story. But the next one, I kind of ran out of time. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do what I do in my training runs and not fuel, but fuel during. And I felt just, I felt better while I was running. So I have just decided that it's not worth it for me to get up early and change the routine from what I would normally do. And the only exception would be if I don't have a hometown race and I would have to drive at least two hours, then I would get up and I would probably eat and then drive there. But most of the time, a lot of the marathons I've done, I've been either local or I'm close by in a hotel and I just walk out and just go. Yeah. And I, I tell everybody, you have to train your nutrition and then you have to race the way you train. And if yeah. that works for you, then great. I would point out, however, that you had your best race when you were fueled. Just yeah. Gonna, as a coach. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that's no, important. definitely. It was also the most horrific race, but yes, <laughs> it was also the youngest. <laughs> uh, but I, I generally tell people to experiment and, and try different things. Certainly the timing of when you eat relative to when you start is very important. You want to make sure your stomach's empty by the time you get to the start. And yeah, everybody's different, but definitely fueling during the run is going to be, is going to be critical to having success. What's your advice for women who might be listening to this, who are saying, oh my gosh, I could never do this. I could never wake up that early. My kids have their activities. I mean, I know my daughter. She's in gymnastics till 930. I mean, I'm not getting to bed till 10, 1030. I mean, there's no way I'm getting up at four to, to go run at 430 every day. To, and I'm as committed as the next person. So what's your advice to women who might be juggling a lot of different kids activities and things like that, but they feel guilty because they, they want to be out there. They want to commit to doing some kind of endurance sport. So what do you tell people to, to try and make their own lives work with endurance training? So look at what you are doing. My friend that I currently run with, she started running when her daughter was doing gymnastics and she had an hour to kill. And she was in town and she just one day threw her running shoes in the car and said while she was at gymnastics, instead of in the car or being on her phone, she started running, first walking and then running. So if you're listening to this and you have to get up early, but you have to stay up late because you have activities, you don't have to get up at 4.30 the first time. What you do is you get up at six and know to be home at 6.30 and do 30 minutes of walking, fast walking, right? And then you do that for a week. And then maybe one of those days you run or you jog. And as you start enjoying it, maybe you get up 15 minutes earlier or an hour earlier, right? I, the, the first time I got up at 3 a.m. to go running to get it done before the kids, my husband was like, why are you doing this? And I'm like, because I'm the stay-at-home mom. I don't have, have any other three hours anywhere else that I can do this, right? So that's my commitment. But that took a year of running and working up to that to do that. So start small. Also, I'm also a soccer mom. My boys all played soccer. So there's a lot of opportunity if you kids do outdoor sports, find another mom on the sideline or a dad and say, 
you know what? I really want to start exercising. Would you want to walk with me Tuesdays and Thursdays instead of sitting on the sign line? Would you want to walk with me? Let's get to know each other and see if you can do that. Walk the field, walk the area, and then eventually start running, right? The first step is taking the first step. That's always the hardest. I used to say the first step is tying on my shoes. That's the hardest, but it really is walking out the door for me and taking that first step. Every single run that I have to do, once I have that first step and I get moving, it's like, yes, I'm there. Because I don't always feel like running. Once I run, I'm happy, but I always feel like it. So find opportunities when your kids are in activities, but that you normally would sit, start moving. That's my best advice. That's great advice. I love it. How long, I mean, you mentioned that you were running on your own in the dark, didn't want anybody to see before you started running with that friend of yours. How long did it take you from that to actually signing up for a race? And how important was it for you to have a finish line? Okay. It was very important. My friend was very pushy on let's do a race, (laughs) let's do a race. So I started running in November of 2006. September of 2007, I spent four months in the Netherlands with my kids to put them in school and to give them a little bit of culture. And I ran the Amsterdam half. And that was in October. And that was my first real race. I'd done one 5k with my friend. And then I was, and then she's like, let's, let's train for something more. Cause we were really running seven, eight, nine miles at a time, a couple times a week. We were just because we could, and we wanted to. And so I was like, a half marathon seems attainable. So I ran my first half in Amsterdam, not knowing anybody except my family, of course, is there. And then while I was there, my friend signed up for a full marathon. So I came back and there were six weeks left to train. I was like, there's no way I can do it. So she ran her first full with me on the sidelines watching. And that was my pivotal moment that I watched her finish and another friend, and I stood there because we she was maybe 420, 430, 445, I don't know, but I stood there for a couple of hours watching such a beautiful sea of people, any color, age, ability, finish 26.2 miles. And I stood there and go, that's what I want to do. I want to be one of those people. And then when she finished, I was like, the next one she's doing, I'm doing. So that year in 2008, I ran my first. I ran um, the Marine Corps. And it was really just that that got me. Once I, I, If you're wondering what it's like, go volunteer at a race, but really be at the finish line. It's inspiring. That's really what inspired me to, to do it. If they can do it, I can do it. I want to do that. I want to feel that way when I finish. Yeah, not a small race, the Marine Corps either. That's a good one to make as your first, right? It was great, except I made every single mistake that you can make. I was so well prepared and I made so many mistakes as we all do. Right? It is, it's not, if you show up your first race and you get everything right, then there's no point never doing another one. I think True. you have to make mistakes so that you can. I, I, I've been doing this for 20 plus years. I still learn things at yeah. every single race. So it's okay to make those mistakes and, and then come back and be like, you know what? Now I need to work on this. And I, that's what keeps us coming back, I think. Yeah, true, true. I do want to run it again. I'm, I'm quite a bit older. I do want to run it again one year and finish it with a smile instead of with a cry. So that will be... Now, I, I smiled when I finished, but I cried halfway through. That's how I should say that. But yeah. <laughs> And- we talked a little bit before we started recording about how your diet changed. So you became during this this journey of yours, how you became a vegan. I myself am not vegan. I'm vegetarian, but I'm always interested in hearing people who train for endurance sport who do have a vegan di- a vegan lifestyle because I I know there are a lot of people who think about doing that and always wonder, oh, am I going to be able to be able to train? Am I going to be able to? And I always say yes, absolutely, a hundred percent. But you're actually living it. So tell us about how, especially as a, a woman, how you're maintaining your protein intake and how you uh, are able to maintain a, a healthy lifestyle, get all of the iron that you need, all the protein that you need, and still be able to train as much as you do every single day. Okay. Yeah. So first I want to say that if you want to go plant-based, definitely get a baseline when you start. So have your doctor's visit, do it at a time 
That's good for you, but within the first three months, get a baseline, get some blood drawn, just so you know where you are. I think that's, and then do that every year. I've been doing it every year. I know where everything is. I'm also a blood donor. So I get my my hemoglobin tested every um, eight weeks when I donate. So I know where I am with my iron intake. So that's actually really, really helpful. So that's what I wanted to say first. I started a vegan diet because our daughter was a, a runner. She ran her first marathon at age 16 and she wanted to go vegan. And I wasn't really interested in it or didn't really know much about it. So I had to do some research to say, does that make any sense? And then she said, I bet you can't do it. Well, that's all I need. So I'm like, yeah, I can. So I, I think I need to put this in context to where I am, how old I am. I'm uh, just about 54. So when I started, I was 45. So I was right for those women listening. I was right at the beginning of uh, menopause, right at the beginning. I was having terrible, horrible symptoms. Like you read about night sweats and hot flashes, everything you can imagine. So I went on a vegan diet, not really understanding what it was about. But one thing I knew is I had to eat more tofu. <laughs> so I'm reading everything. And at first, I was trying to veganize all the food that I was eating. So if I made mac and cheese for the kids, I would make vegan mac and cheese for myself. And that really didn't work very well. So I started eating more tofu. And about two weeks in, I was like, I lost a little bit of weight. But I noticed the hot flashes weren't really coming anymore. By the end of six weeks... Every single symptom that I had had that I could contribute to premenopausal symptoms, they were gone. I kind of did a check with my husband. I'm like, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Because, And he's like, yeah, it's kind of weird, but it's gone. So I decided that for me, that was cause enough for me to stay on this plant-based diet. And that was six weeks in. So yeah, and I want to be clear that that's that's your experience. And that, that is my experience only. Experience. That is not yeah. advice for anybody else. Tofu has a very, very, very low dose of estrogen, so that's I think what made the change for me. So I am now fifty four. I'm on the other end of that, and I recently started having some symptoms again and realized that I'd fallen off on tofu because I have really switched to whole foods. So I'm doing a lot of beans and so to get the protein and didn't necessarily want to eat protein every day, tofu every day. But I've decided to go back to at least tofu four times a week. I think that's going to help me. But I'm very in tune with how I feel. Now, as far as B12, I take nutritional yeast whenever I can. I put it in a lot of meals, but I take a B12 supplement. I take iron now twice a week because I used to take it every day. I don't need to take it every day anymore. My hemoglobin is really good. So just being aware of where you are, getting a medical checkup every year, and if you don't feel good, obviously more often, but really eating the rainbow, guys. <laughs> For me, that walking into a grocery store, a third of my cart is filled with fruits and vegetables, a third. That's, I'm buying every color every week. So and and then I'll figure out what I'm going to do with it. Buy a, I buy a bag of kale and a bag of spinach and a cauliflower and I buy something purple. I buy beets and I buy bananas and all the different colors of fruits and vegetables. And then I cook them and eat them and I supplement them with beans and rice and rice noodles and uh, sometimes pasta. But I don't feel tired. I feel good. So th there's just a lot of information out there. If you need to look to any kind of culture. I started looking to the Thai culture, the Asian culture, Thai and Indian. They have very little, Thai has very little dairy and uh, you can easily take the meat out. And Indian, they do some cheese. But so I started looking for Thai and Indian recipes. And that's real. I cook a lot like that. I have fresh garlic, fresh ginger, fresh herbs, and everything tastes so much better. My family is so happy when I did it. <laughs> I could tell you that. So that's what I was. That's what I was going to ask because in my house, I'm the only one. I'm the only plant based person, and so that's why I'm not vegan because it's a problem. We still have two kids here, and my wife will never do it. Yeah. But what What was the situation in your house? You said your daughter, but you had other kids, and you had a husband. Did they all end up making right? So when I started, everybody was still living at home. My oldest one might have just run, gone off to college. I don't remember nine years ago. Maybe he had just gone off to college. But they didn't really complain, right? Because initially I was making double meals, which is not sustainable. So then my husband became vegan. My daughter was vegan. So three of us would eat something. And then I would make on the side, I would make 
meat for them, meatballs or so because the vegetable and the and the rice everybody can eat, right? Whether you're vegan or not, they just want it meat with it. I used a crock pot a lot, so I would do two things vegan and one thing of meat in the. I had a, a triple crock pot because I had all these kids at home, so that worked well for us. I'm at the point now with the two boys that still live at home that any meal that I make that's vegan, they like it. They love it. Actually, they eat it. They love it. If they cook, they will happily eat a steak. They will put bacon in their soup. They they supplement on their own and they're old enough to cook. But I make a lot of stews like sweet potato peanut stew or split pea soup. There's a lot of different varieties of soups and stews that you can make that have a variety of proteins and vegetables in it. Very, very flavorful. And so they'll add meat to it. They'll add ham or they'll add meatballs or something. So that that works out really well for us. It was definitely a process. And I got the buy-in from my husband and my daughter initially. But for yourself, even if you do two or three meals a week as a family with no meat, that's a great place to start. It's a great place. I mean, everybody loves beans. Why not make burritos? You can, you don't necessarily, or burritos or tacos. You don't always need meat with it, but you can. Yeah. And there's a lot of meat supplements out there now, which also helps. So yeah, I do want to take the last couple of minutes we have and give you a chance to tell us about strategy talks. I'm interested in hearing about what is the podcast you do? So the podcast is about, is, is for business, small business owners, entrepreneurs, marketers, want to talk strategy for a business, mostly marketing. I'm a, I'm a social media marketer. Talk about all a variety of different things. So sometimes I have an SEO, SEO specialist or my daughter actually was on last week and she talked about how to present as an introvert. I have experts in speaking. I have experts in Instagram or LinkedIn. They come and tell people, give the latest tips, the latest trends. So it's very much an interview like you and I just did, or I have somebody who's an expert in some kind of marketing or business topic, and we talk about that topic in a strate- in a way how other people can use it strategically. Awesome. Well, Doreen, uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on today and uh, chatting with me. This is a really interesting conversation that I think a lot of people are going to get something out of. I think uh, not just women who might be listening who might be dealing with their own busy lives, but I think a lot of guys too, because a lot of, I know that I went through a lot of the same challenges that you described uh, as a a dad when my kids were young and didn't really manage it as well as I could have looking back. But uh, I think a lot of the things you talked about, community, accountability, making your training fit your life and, uh, sorry, yeah, making your training fit your life as opposed to your life fit your training, having uh, a finish line and just Making all these smart choices, I think, really led to the success that you've been able to have and is why you're always smiling when you're running. So yeah. that's really great. Thanks again for joining me here today. Doreen I can be found at all kinds of places on social media, and I will have all of those listed in the show notes. Doreen, thanks again for joining me on the Trader Podcast. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. And that's it for another episode. The TriDoc Podcast is produced and edited by me, Jeff Sankoff, along with my interns. I'm Agent Johnson. This is Special Agent Johnson. Oh, how you doing? No relation. I'm, uh... I'm Jeff Sankoff, uh, the the TriDoc. I'm in charge here. Not anymore. Those interns are Ian Johnson and Ben Johnson. You can find the show notes for everything discussed on the show today, as well as archives of previous episodes at tridocpodcast.com. Do you have questions about any of the issues discussed on this episode, or do you have a question that you'd like for me to consider answering on a future episode? Send me an email at tri underscore doc at icloud.com, or join the private Tridoc Podcast Facebook group on Facebook, and you can submit your questions there. If you're interested in coaching services, please visit try.coaching.com or lifesportcoaching.com, where you can find a lot of information about me and the services that I provide. You can also follow me on the TriDoc Podcast Facebook page, TriDoc Coaching on Instagram, and the TriDoc Coaching YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this podcast, I hope that you'll consider leaving me a rating and a review, as well as subscribe to the show wherever you download it. And of course, there's always the option of becoming a supporter of the podcast at patreon.com forward slash try.podcast. 
The music heard at the beginning and the end of the show is Radio by Empty Hours and is used with permission. This song and many others like it can be found at ReverbNation.com, where I hope that you'll visit and give small independent bands a chance. The TriDoc Podcast will be back again soon with another medical question for me to answer and another interview with someone in the world of multisport. Until then, remember 1121 and train hard, train healthy.